Um, so I'm from, uh, from New Zealand originally, um, and I was born and raised there. Um, well, we moved to uh, Melbourne uh, eight or nine years ago, and uh, you know, I just needed to expand my knowledge, I suppose, as a chef. Um, and um, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> today, you know, um, we're going to talk about uh, a few things, I guess, that, uh, you know, that, that concern me and make me happy and uh, make me sad. Um, and um, we're just going to start by, uh, by talking about fame. And uh, to me, you know, uh, fame is a strange thing and uh, it can destroy a lot of shifts. You know, it's artificial. Um, we've all seen some sad examples. Um, it, be, it sort of becomes like it's a play and, you know, you're on stage and people begin acting and they lose uh, touch with what's really important. Um, you know, they, they pursue it and they uh, find stimulation in it and they uh, surround themselves with help, people who help perpetuate that for them. Living in the city, I felt like I'd, I'd started to lose the true reason of why I became a cook. I felt suppressed. It took the fun out of it and it took the creativity away from it. Getting back to basics and hanging out with people that uh, don't care if I'm a celebrity, whatever, or um, even they don't even care if I'm good as a cook. You know, people who just uh, want the best for me and only care if I'm a decent human being. Um, I wanted a, a more pure upbringing for my three children and, uh, you know, where they could interact with nature. And I wanted to further explore my love and relationship with the sea. These were reasons for leaving the city four years ago. My name is Ben, as I said. Um, I'm a chef. I come from uh, Attica, it's a small restaurant in Melbourne. Um, you know, I grew up in, uh, in New Zealand, in rural New Zealand, and uh, you know, in, on an incredible farm, in a very isolated place, and absolutely remarkable, you know. Uh, I don't know if anyone has seen the film The Piano, um, but that, was, uh, that was, film was filmed on my parents' farm, so it's very dark, there's wow. black sand beaches, it's a very uh, emotional place, um, a very tough place. We had a really strong connection with nature on the farm. Uh, my parents had 3,000 acres and 1,500 of it was uh, native bush. And we were at the mercy of it quite often, you know, through floods, through, sh through slips. Um, such a tough, tough job, you know, a farmer, to make a living from farming. You know, it's brutal. And I spent 13 years watching my father work as a slave on the farm. You know, we had sheep and cattle. And it's very hard to understand, unless you've been there, how much energy and how much effort it takes to grow our ingredients. Um, life revolved around the, you know, the table at home. We didn't have a television until I was 10 years old. And, uh, and because of this, you know, we found our, our, our fun in cooking and, in, and, and growing. And um, you know, we grew the majority of our own produce because we were so isolated. We would only go to town every six weeks. I have a vivid memory of my father who, uh, you know, who took a gun and uh, shot the bullock, uh, the cow in the head tied a, a rope around its neck and lifted it up with the, the uh, front of the uh, tractor and he proceeded to bleed it and skin it and gut it. My dad, you know, he wasn't the best butcher and uh, he, uh, I remember him cutting it up and there were steaks and there was, you know, inside the steaks there was a piece of artery and uh, big veins. Uh, it put me off meat for many years. Um, we, uh, we went to a school with seven students. Um, two of them were my sisters and my mother was a school teacher. <laughs> um, and it was like uh, really almost like the Amish, you know, uh, and it, it was also an incredibly creative environment because we had a lot of time to ourselves and we had this incredible farm and bush to explore. Uh, when, I was, when I was only seven years old and my sister was, Tess was five, we uh, walked across the farm one and a half hours and we uh, walked into the native bush and we walked up to an old logger's hut. And uh, inside the hut, you know, it was like something uh, like very spooky. And uh, we cooked our own dinner that night inside the hut. And I remember what it was. It was uh, a pot of boiled pasta we cooked over an open fire. We tried to supplement our meal with a, by catching an eel from uh, the river, but the eel had different plans and it, uh, and it bit me on the heel. It was just as well because the eels in that part of the world are very big and muddy and quite disgusting. And... Uh, we also ate a moss called Old Man's Bear that my father had showed us that we could eat. Um, and it was predominantly used on uh, train sets as a decoration. And I remember thinking it's, it's much better to use it as a decoration than to eat it. Um, 
So I moved to Melbourne nine years ago to, uh, like I said, to expand my knowledge. Melbourne is amazing. Australia, Australians are some of the most incredibly generous people when they make us feel at home and it's really, it's really nice to be there. Um, I started at Attica six years ago because we were flat broke as a family. I had one child then and I was earning $600 a week and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't paying the bills. Um, I was thinking of actually going to cook burgers, uh, but the job at Attica came and, and that's how we started. It wasn't exactly an overnight assess, like Jill said. Uh, it, it really took a long time and we nearly went broke quite, you know, many times. Um, the main reason why I wanted to do that was because I always wanted to develop my own style and uh, I feel really passionate about that. You know, I think creativity is something that's underrated in cooking. Um, I live one and a half hours away from the restaurant by the sea. And uh, this, is for, this is for inspiration and uh, just to get out of the city. I have a small, passionate team who uh, have a lot of self-belief. Uh, I guess you could say I'm a foraging chef, but I think that term has become about as popular as foodie. And, uh, <laughs> you know, nowadays in Australia, everyone's calling this a foraging <coughs> chef, you know. And uh, it's nothing new. You know, we all know that it goes back thousands of years, and no more so in my, my adopted country, Australia, where... You know, the, the Australian Aboriginal and the, the Torres Strait Island people were, you know, some of the most preeminent foragers in history. Um, it's, it's popular now, but it, we were ridiculed for it once, um, like many people, like Rene. Um, and uh, we, we are mostly urban foragers. Uh, so we forage around the restaurant by the train lines in Melbourne. Um, and it's quite combative, you know. Um, we have a lot of altercations with people. Uh, and, you know, we, we might be picking along the train lines and someone will see us and call the police. And the police will come. The, counts, the, the public are funny with foraging in Australia too sometimes. You know, uh, I'll be picking and they'll be looking at me in a very strange way. And, uh, and they're looking at me with contempt and I'm looking back at them with contempt because you know, they're looking at me thinking, well, you know, what the hell is that guy picking? You know, uh, that's very strange. And I'll look at them thinking, well, where the hell is that person going? You know, it's, it's very strange. They're going probably to the supermarket to buy their bland sorrel when, and I'm picking my, my perfectly good wild sorrel. Um, we, uh, you know, it's not just enough to forage, though, as a chef. You know, we need to, uh, we need to, you know, really um, make the cooking process central to our development as chefs. I mean, it's not just enough to forage and garden. We have to take those ingredients and, and, and cook them into something meaningful. Um, each day, you know, we approach our work with fresh eyes, and uh, we cross-check everything we do many times. It's quite collaborative. We also, you know, really embrace a, a DIY mentality. Um, and that's a central uh, philosophy of ours at Attica. Um, you know, take this, this 44 gallon drum for instance, you know, it's, it's in the back of the garage and it's rusting and nobody cares for it. You know, that's, that's a perfectly excellent cooking imp implement, you know, take the hypothetical refrigerator in the back of the, uh, back of the tent here, kick to the curb, throw it away. That's the perfect chamber, you know, to build an amazing cold smoker from. You know, I'm not a rich man, but I never felt richer than when I feasted on the scraps of society, the things that are all around us. You know, whether it's, whether it's the weeds that nobody cares for along the train lines in a city, um, you know, whether, it's, whether it's an oil drum, you know, we, we try to use many things. If it's the oranges on the neighbor's tree falling over you know, onto your fence, or maybe the branches over your fence, and you can get, you know, a, 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 you know, get something and pull them down and, and take those oranges, well, technically, yes, it's not illegal, but I mean, it's good to make use of that stuff. They're delicious. Um, so for us, creativity, flavor, and, and integrity are the driving factors. Um, and you know, just accessing the many small suppliers that exist in our, in our area, and more, many small growers, we have six different you know, growers for six different nuts who all you know, grow and shell and sell their nuts. And when I discovered these people you know, five years ago, it changed the way my food tasted. You know? uh, they're such a high quality than just ordering them from you know, the dry goods supplier who doesn't really you know, care where they come from. Um, you know, I feel like one way we can really make a change for the better is through, uh, you know, is by incorporating indigenous ingredients, culture and tradition into our cuisines. This, requ this requires careful thought, however, because, you know, if we, if we just take that, that knowledge and, we, and we, we, don't, we, we don't acknowledge that inspiration, then, you know, we really build something which is, um, you know, hollow and, and tasteless and lacks meaning. And it was very easy to take, you know, this inspiration and to just present it as something that you just thought of. Um, if we do this, though, you know, and we acknowledge that this will give our cuisine uniqueness. So, 
You know, native vegetation is one of the most rich and uh, fundamental elements of our, of our natural heritage. You know, native vegetation binds and nourishes our ancient soils. It shelters and sustains wildlife. It protects our streams, our wetlands, and our coastlines. And that's not even mentioning that it absorbs carbon dioxide and emits oxygen. You know, the continued, continued depletion and destruction of native vegetation is a primary driver of land degradation and declining water quality. And it's the biggest cause for biodiversity loss on our planet. These losses are um, you know, brought about by, obviously, uh, you know, the clearing of land for agriculture and for uh, housing. And the losses are compounded further by you know, irresponsible grazing. You know, the, the, you know, I witnessed this in, as a child. You know, the farmer doesn't mend his fence and lets his, his cattle get into the back, of the, uh, the, the back of the bush, and then the cattle run through the bush and, and, and damage the vegetation. Um, you know, salinity is a problem in Australia as well, salty soil. Um, and that's having, has been brought about by cutting down our trees and you know, allowing um, plants with a lower root structure um, to grow them, bringing the, the salt up to the, up to the soil. And also weeds are a big problem as well. Um, you know, take the example of you know, 80 years uh, after the abandonment of a, of a mine site in Kadena in uh, South Australia, 80 years to, to this day, the only thing that remains is mosses that grow there. You know, it hasn't been touched for 80 years. Nothing's grown back, really. So there's the question, you know, how do we as a society, and not just the farmers, you know, take responsibility for the health of our soil, our water, and therefore our biodiversity? I feel that chefs that forage for wild plant foods have a responsibility to understand the ecosystems that they forage in. In Tasmania, in the island south of Australia, there is a there's a, there's a parrot called the orange-bellied parrot, and there's only 180 of these, these parrots left in the whole world. Now, this parrot, every April, migrates to, uh, to the Ballerine Peninsula, where I live, and the number one thing that it likes to eat, this endangered parrot, is, is uh, samphire, or glasswort, or salicornia. And so imagine if I was ripping <coughs> you know, that, that vegetation out of there <coughs> for use at my restaurant. Imagine the, impact that I, the negative impact that I could be, could be having on this, you know, on this bird. And also, you know, many things are, can be affected in a negative way if we're, not, if we're not careful, I suppose, you know. If we pick too much seaweed or too much sea lettuce from certain areas in, in my state, um, then we're, we're, you know, damaging the survival chances of an of a, uh, endangered type of sea, uh, shellfish. So it's really about understanding the community of organisms in an ecosystem, as well as the components that the organisms interact with, such as air, soil, water, and sunlight. <coughs> Foraging chefs need to become the owners of, the ha of these habitats. You know, these areas that I go to, I, I try to manage it, and I try to uh, take care of it. You know, uh, it's like I take ownership for these uncared areas that, but, that people like, are not interested in along the train lines or even on the pen peninsula where I live. You know, I, I, I always uh, own that area, you know, and if I see somebody that's uh, doing something in that area that, that I dislike, you know, like dumping rubbish or polluting in some way, like, I'm going to deal with it, you know, and uh, not just turn a blind eye. It's just so easy to walk past that stuff. Um, you know, I, I like to take a little bit as well. We, you know, we, for six years, I pick sea lettuce from one place every, almost every day. And for six years, almost every day, I pick up the rubbish from that place. And it's for no reason of publicity or anything. It's just because there's rubbish there. And I don't want to you know, spend time picking the rubbish up, but it needs to be picked up. And no one else is going to do it, or no one else does do it. And people walk past as I'm picking up, and they say, oh, that's so great what you're doing. You know, like, you're, picking up, you know, you're picking up all this rubbish. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, would you help? You know, like, <laughs> please. You know, like, we really, you know, the beach really needs your help. You know, but they'd be like, well, no, I'm going to call you know, the environmental services department instead and make them clean it up. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I have a dream, like, though, where chefs who are foraging, you know, they're targeting you know, these nasty weeds that actually cause native vegetation loss, you know, these edible weeds. You know, imagine that, you know, chefs you know, who forage could be making a, you know, a really positive change by removing the plants which choke out these native plants, you know, which take their nutrients and take their water and take their sunlight. Um, you know, I, I grew up in this young country in, in New Zealand and, and then later in Australia, and I was very frustrated as a young cook. You know, it's, it's, 
difficult to put it into words. You know, our, our countries don't have like strong culinary heritages. You know, not it doesn't go back for hundreds, even you know, thousands of years. Um, but what we do have is, you know, and I didn't realize this at first, but we do have is these really strong, um, you know, heritage of our indigenous people, the, the, uh, the New Zealand Maori and, um, you know, the Australian uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. And I began to use, you know, inspiration from these cultures, um, from my own country's culture, as well as life experiences, as Jill mentioned, like nearly drowning um, when I was, you know, I was 10. Um, the mountains which I grew up under, um, and I wanted to create, you know, a personal cuisine that spoke of my own country through this. Um, you know, one of the first uh, inspirations that I took was from the New Zealand hangi. You know, this is an amazing cookery method where um, you dig a pit in the earth and you, uh, you lay tree trunks over the pit and you put volcanic rocks on the trunks and you lay more trunks and you have more rocks and you build this big thing up over this ditch of this pit and you light it and when it you know, over time, the, the branches give way and everything falls into the pit. And then in the end, all you're left with is, is hot ash and, uh, and hot rocks. And then you put like a flax, which is a, like a plant, and you put that over the rocks as insulation. And then you put your meats and, you know, you, you put your vegetables. And in New Zealand, it would be, you know, kumara or mutton birds. And, um, and then you, uh, and you cover the whole thing with dirt. And, uh, and this is delicious, very unusual flavor. And I, I came up with a dish where we, where, we cook, where we took the dirt and the potatoes um, from the same era, you know, the, literally the earth that the potatoes were grown in, and we, and we cooked it in our, with our own technique, but using this technique of the New Zealand Maori as our inspiration. Um, and I used uh, nature and, I guess, our um, cultural history as a catalyst for the creation of new dishes. Um, I've brought a little something here, um, and this is from, you know, from our, uh, our Maori culture. Um, it's quite uh, full on. It's only about three weeks into its process, of about, uh, which will be about four months. Um, so it's, it's nowhere near as funky as it's going to be. Yes, please. Um, don't eat it, just have a smell. <laughs> um, we call this uh, in, in New Zealand rotten corn. And uh, what, ha what used to happen was uh, with, with the New Zealand around? Maori, they, at the end of autumn, they would have too much corn. And uh, they would stack it um, on the land where it would uh, begin to ferment and, and then <coughs> but eventually go rotten and they wouldn't be able to use it. So they had this ingenious idea of taking the corn, putting it into like a flax basket or a sack, tying some kind of rope onto the end of it and throwing it in the river and then putting it, you know, holding onto one end and tying it onto the river. And it would sit in the river for four months where it would water cure and it would ferment in the water, fresh running water in a stream. Um, and, um, you know, I... I basically researched this a little bit, and uh, there was only two examples of you know, river-cured vegetables that I had come up with. There's one was the corn, and the other one was uh, the use of uh, curing hashish or buds uh, from marijuana um, in, in, in water. I don't know anything about that, though. <laughs> um, if, we could just, uh, if we could just play a film um, that I've, that I've uh, made. It's just a very personal little film, and um, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. What, Kobe? Oh, toilet paper! Do you want toilet paper? by the coast, by the sea, in a place called uh, Taranaki. So my father, um, he taught his children how to take care of yourself in the bush and he taught me how to identify some different species of plants that grew wild and that you could eat. As I grew older, I continued to do it as well uh, by myself. And I'd forgotten about it for a few years until I had my own son, Kobe, and uh, he's almost seven years old now. And I thought about those experiences uh, and that knowledge that my father had taught me 
and I just thought about how valuable it is and how it seems like it's in danger of becoming lost a little bit. We live such busy lives now. A regular occurrence for our family was to go to the ocean and to gather different shellfish. One thing in particular that we gathered was abalone, or in New Zealand it's known as pawa. light a fire on the beach and we would cook what we'd gathered, whether it was mussels, abalone, sea urchins. So I grew up with that, it was part of our life. I'm concerned that, that my son may not be able to show his own son these creatures. One of the biggest problems is uh, poaching. I mean, it's a major illegal industry, it's a, it's a huge black market for diving for abalone and and it's an industry that's worth millions and millions of dollars. It's uh, sad because, um, I mean, I remember being at the beach with my father. We'd been out snorkeling ourselves, gathering seafood on a reef. I remember going back to the car park, and I remember seeing an old Holden Kingswood parked up on the beach there, and there was a bloke. He opened the boot of his car, and inside the car, it was completely full with abalone of all sizes. I was probably six or seven years old, maybe Kobe's age. And I remember looking at it and him and thinking, you know, understanding completely at that age how wrong that was. Always stuck to the limit, you know, that was my father's steadfast, you know, you don't take more than you need to eat. So I wanted to impart some of that knowledge onto my son and teach him to have an appreciation for the sea just to impart some of the things that my father had passed on. I want to um, keep that going a little bit in our family. Thank you. Um, you know, it's quite hard for me to share uh, that story with, um, with people, especially my son. I'm quite a private sort of a person. You know, I feel like the main way forward is for us to reconnect with nature through our children and our youngest cooks. They are the ones that are going to be left to clean up the mess of us and of our forefathers. You know, uh, the film is about... Um, you know, my life in New Zealand as I, was, as I was young, and also about the technique of the uh, Australian Aboriginal people from Tasmania, where they, um, you know, where they would light a fire and they would cook uh, bull kelp, which is uh, sort of in the fire down here, and which, uh, which hazel is pounded on the rock. And they would roast it, and then uh, they would eat it, um, you know, they would hydrate it again and then eat it, and it was somewhat of a delicacy for them. And, um, you know, the, the film is also about, you know, abalone, which is a mollusk and the largest sea snail. Um, in Great Britain, it's known as orma. In New Zealand, it's known as pawa. In South Africa, it's perlimon. Uh, mutton fish in Australia, um, I think it's abuon in Spain. Uh, and in the rest of the world, in California, it's known as abalone. Uh, the value of, um, you know, and... and and cultural importance of it in my country cannot be underrated. It's, uh, it was a traditional food of both the New Zealand Maori and the Aboriginal people. 
And, uh, and now it's, um, you know, it's really uh, something that's quite sinister. It's become, uh, you know, it's become the object and target of organised crime and gangs uh, who, who poach it in, in the thousands. And they, um, and they use it as currency to exchange drugs with. And, um, you know, it's much easier to launder abalone than it is to launder money. Um, you know, there's also uh, impacted by not only poaching, but an ecological disaster um, where, uh, you know, a form of ab abalone herpes uh, was, you know, was started inside a farm, um, an inland aquaculture farm, and it got out into the ocean and it contaminated uh, stocks of wild abalones in the area that I live in. And uh, sadly, it um, killed 95% of abalone in a 200 kilometer stretch um, in about 1996, uh, 2006, sorry. Um, but really, you know, more than anything, abalone to me is a symbol of greed. You know, it's, it's the length that humankind will go to for money, you know, for the almighty dollar. What will we stop at? You know, will we just, will we take every last thing? Will we take every last fish? You know, you might be thinking to yourself, what relationship does abalone have to vegetation? Well, unfortunately, you know, uh, vegetation can have a negative effect on, on abalone through the ways that we farm mostly now, you know, through the use of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, herbicides and so on, chemicals that we put on our crops. You know, they, they, um, and what happens, is, as many of you will know, when it rains, those, those chemicals have got to go somewhere. And if the ground is already saturated, the earth won't take it. And it runs off and it runs into our streams and into our creeks, into our rivers and into, eventually into our, into our sea. And, and it decimates the vegetation and in the rivers and the wildlife in our rivers, and then in the ocean, it causes havoc with things like abalone and different seaweeds. Um, you know, this um, this is this is caused by the way that we farm now. You know, and to me, this damage is all hidden. You know, we can't really see this. Um, but as passionate lovers and providers of food, it's our responsibility to have this information at hand. You know, um, so we can make def informed decisions. I mean, this damage is not related to not limited to Australia. I mean, this this will be happening in your own countries as well. Everything in this natural world is connected. Right now, in this moment in history, every cook has the opportunity to effect a change. The question is, will you take that opportunity? Will you live with it and make it a part of your daily lives? We must empower ourselves to bring this change through our menu choices. Every year at Attica, on the website, our menu is downloaded 40,000 times. That's an awesome responsibility. Through poor choices, I could, and my, my colleagues could decide the fate of an entire species of fish or plant. If I have unsustainable <coughs> foods on my menu, then I'm a part of the problem. I can't live with that. I want to be a part of the solution. Good cooking, to me, is about the process and the heart of it not about ulterior motives, contests, or awards. It should be about learning blind. That is the real center of creativity. Living in the moment of the process and not getting in the way of yourself by doing things that don't matter. It's about the ingredients and the cooking process and what comes from the absolute pure devotion to the act of it. Thank you very much. Bravo! Bravo! Amazing, Chuck. Amazing. Thank you.